Regenerative farming and gardening isn't always easy. However, when chemical farming isn't working, more and more farmers are turning towards regenerative, organic, and biodynamic methods because they're finding it's better for the soil, better for their health, and better for the environment, and better for their production. Jean and Shelley Covert of Covert Farms Family Estates found that when the chemical farming methods that they were using weren't no longer working, regenerative organic farming was the absolute answer they were looking for. It helped them save a tomato crop that they thought they were going to lose. And they have more organic matter in their soil today than they've ever had before. In fact, in 1959, when the farm was first purchased, it was known as a desert. It was literally sand and people actually thought their family was crazy for buying that land because they didn't think anything could be grown on it. And today it needs less water than it's needed ever before. It's prolific in its production and it's only increasing in organic matter. In this interview with Shelly and Jean, you're going to learn a lot about what's worked for them and what some of their biggest challenges have been. Enjoy the interview. I'm Natalie Forsbauer, founder and editor-in-chief of Heart and Soil Magazine. Heart and Soil Magazine is the magazine and resource people go to to learn about regenerative farming and gardening and regenerative living from experts, farmers, leaders, and scientists in the regenerative space. It's full of interviews, resources, strategies, stories, tips, and how to be an advocate for yourself and for the planet, to live regeneratively, to exist and coexist regeneratively. It's an amazing community that amplifies global regenerative health and planetary health through regeneration. If you haven't subscribed yet, I invite you to head over to heartandsoilmagazine.com, click on that subscribe button and join us for just $39.99 a year. So where are you right now? Uh, we're in the northwest corner of our property. Um, a little uh, shady spot with some trees uh, where we have uh, our herd of cattle. Um, they're just uh, finished grazing up behind us and then uh, they're moving farther south to some fresh pastures. Okay, nice. How do you move your cattle? Uh, we just open up the fence and they wander to the next pasture. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and usually, uh, if they're not paying attention, you just whistle to them and they come running. Oh, that's awesome. And if we have to move them further across the farm, then we just have bikes or quads that yeah. we guide them with. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, that's awesome. What generation farmers are you there at your farm? Uh, we're third generation and um, yeah, so our kids are fourth generation. Wow. And are how many of them are farming with you? Well, they're 14, uh, 18 and 21. So right now we have the 21 year old is done university for the year. So he's home working and uh, the other two are still in school until tomorrow. But one does our youngest does our tours, our um guided mini farm tours and the other one is our mechanic until he goes away to university next year that is awesome and is he a self-taught mechanic uh well dad taught and our we had a mechanic on the farm too so he worked with him and he's worked uh, with his brother so That's yeah and he does the for, more formal uh, high school mechanics he's been doing that since uh grade nine i think so wow is he going to go into mechanics or what's he going into uh, he's going into mechanical engineering. Nice. Nice. So my youngest daughter is really into helping out on the farm and doing mechanics and fixing all the farm equipment. So it's kind of cool when you have someone that's interested in that, that's there. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> and yeah, super helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Big time. So yeah. I was looking at your website and one of the reasons I wanted to spend some time with you is because you are a farm that transitioned from conventional to organic and using biodynamic and regenerative practices and and as I was going through preparing for this interview and reading more of the backstory what I came across was in 1959 who was it that brought your 
bought their land originally. Was that your great grandfather then? Uh, grandfather, yeah. Yeah, yeah, your yeah, grandfather, my grandfather uh, George, uh, George, and uh, my grandmother Winifred. Okay, yeah, and they bought the original three hundred and fifty acres, and it was literally sand, like literally desert when they bought it. And they, it was actually a picture in the paper saying that um, a number of years ago that people laughed when they bought it because they wanted to farm it. And then looking at it today, you'd never know that it was. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know sand. he came with the experience of Southern California, Central Valley, where. You know, they put in all the irrigation canals and, you know, it's, you know, bread basket of Western North America, you know, growing in the desert in those sandy conditions. So for him, it was kind of like, I don't know why anyone hasn't bought this already. Wow. That is so awesome. It's, but just different, uh, different contexts and different, you know, and that's, uh, it's one of the, one of the key things is, you know, knowing your context and, and such, and, you know, of your, of your farm and of your land and such. So. It's so true. Um, yeah, Elaine, Elaine yeah. Ingham speaks to that actually a lot that you can grow in sand. It's just a matter of having the right microbiology. So uh, let's dive into a bit of your story. Um, when, so was there farm, it was the farm farm conventionally right up until you transitioned it to organic? Yes, yes. And, um, uh, my father, uh, Mike Covert, uh, he, was, he was starting to look more and more onto the organic side of um, things, um, back in what, I guess like mid nineties, mm -hmm. I guess, but, um, he was still pretty hooked into the conventional side of things. Um, mm -hmm. we had, um, uh, a crop consultant, mainly for the orchard, uh, Hillary Sampson, who did a lot of consulting for organic farms. And so one of the things, uh, we did is, uh, we, we got her report both in conventional, um, management tech plans and organic management plans for her weekly or bi-weekly updates. So um, in some situations, uh, we'd use the organic uh, recommendations because um, A, it could have been less expensive and, um, you know, more benign and maybe offered some longer term solutions. Um, Shelly has a good example of one of those when you guys went off summer pruning and well, yeah, we went to another apple orchards, um, Chris Yentz, who had quite a few ladybugs in his orchard. And so we went and pruned summer prunes from his apples and then put them into ours so we could get, build up our ladybug population so we could help with our aphid wow. problem that we had at the time. Neat. Then and it worked too. It was, pretty, yeah. it was pretty funny. It was, you know, it was like at the time, you know, unconventional. Like we took one of the three ton flatbed trucks and filled it up with apple prunings like fresh cut uh, summer printings and then drove down the rows, throwing them into the trees. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And so I think, we, I think we got, most, uh, I think we, it was also, uh, we we're also looking for um, um, predatory mites as well, because we'd had mite issues and stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, and it, uh, it actually solved uh, a number of issues. So so yeah, then we transferred that over to getting bags of burlap bags of ladybugs and releasing them in our potatoes and in our eggplants because we had a potato beetle problem. And so the ladybugs eat their eggs and larvae. So yeah. And how did that work for you? And it worked really well. We did that for quite a few years, especially during our transitional years going mm. into organic farming. And then Things just kind of worked out themselves. Sorry. <laughs> Someone's saying hello. <laughs> I had a curious cow. <laughs> this guy usually runs around, but they're a little curious this morning. And yeah, funny. they're like, what's going on over there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're talking to a yeah. tree and it's talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what inspired that transition to organic then? So you became kind of curious about it and then you saw some things work or what was that? that moment uh, really so we were we were starting to have a family and we were eating organic ourselves mm -hmm. and um i had sprayed in the vineyard when we were or in the orchard when we were conventional and as gene had as well and we both weren't comfortable with that so mm -hmm. we really wanted to do a transition over to organic we are just a little skeptical whether it would work because we're such sandy soil 
-hmm. We thought it would be a really tough thing to do to transition all of our sandy soil over to organic. So we started with a small plot at first for the first two years. First year. And then decided we were going to go all in with it. No, two years wow. after. We did. Yeah, we did. Um, yeah, a 20 acre field that we essentially abandoned. Um, uh, cause it had, uh, sclerotinia, uh, which like, um, which, uh, wiped out a tomato crop, um, when we were conventional. And so we had planted it to clover and essentially just left it alone and, and, uh, didn't know what we were going to do with it. And so it, it actually worked out well that we, when we did go to transition, we could sort of transition into T3 right off the bat. Cause we mm. had this in clover for four years. Yeah. And, uh, so we did that first field, um, I think we only planted five acres of the 20 acres uh, and I think it was just Roma tomatoes. So it, because of um, not being able to have a parallel production, we had to pick a crop yep. that we were familiar with. And uh, that was, you know, the morphology of it was identifiable uh, from the other crops. So we did Roma tomatoes and uh, I, an interesting story from that, uh, that crop year. Um, so just to the South in the next field over, we had 20, four acres of conventional tomatoes, uh, field tomatoes and uh, grape tomatoes. And um, we'd had a very wet spring mm -hmm. and the conventional tomatoes are looking terrible. The leaves are turning black at the bottom and they got spots on them. And, and, um, but the, uh, the organic tomatoes are looking fine. And, and so there's, here's this mystery now what's going on. And yeah. so we had sent, um, uh, tissue samples off to uh, the Abbotsford lab and uh, the results came back uh, not very not very good that it was uh, bacterial canker and you might as well write off your tomato crop wow. and so driving up and down the valley I noticed that um, a lot of the other tomato fields were affected similarly but there was a standout that wasn't so uh, I knew the farmer went and talked to him and and so I asked him what he was spraying because as a conventional farmer, um, you know, it's recommended uh, that you use different uh, chemistries all the time to mix things up and not create resistance. So that's what we were dutifully doing. But the, uh, the organic field, uh, all we could use at the time was copper, uh, which was allowed in organic production. So, um, and copper is actually one of the few things that works on bacterial um, diseases. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and so the neighbor, that's all he had been spraying to is copper. And, oh. um, and so I found, uh, I found an Ontario production guide, which, you know, they have a lot more disease pressure in Ontario, much more, much more moisture and such, and mm -hmm. uh, found out their recommendations for bacterial issues. Um, and so long story short, if it wasn't for growing the five acres of organic tomatoes, we would have lost the 24 acres. So we sprayed it with copper every four or five days and it totally went away and we had the best crop we'd had in years. That's amazing. What a yeah. good story. And that was that, then you knew, you knew that it was possible. Well, we knew it was possible. And you know, that was one. So we had to kind of start going through the, the checklist of all the yes. diseases and insects and issues. <laughs> You know, how can we, how can we manage this? And so we added another 20 acres the next year, um, started adding more crops and, um, and then on the third year, uh, we basically, at the end of the second year, we were like, we, we got the paperwork involved in keeping track of a conventional farm and an organic farm is ludicrous. So, mm -hmm. um, we just said, all right, we're all in now. And, and so we certified 142 acres um in the third season and uh haven't looked back ever since that's exciting and how many acres do you farm in total now uh we're farming um let's see just uh about what's it uh about 65 acres that that we're farming mm -hmm. and then we have leases on uh we have an organic lease uh for some table grapes and ground crop mm. uh and then a conventional uh vineyard lease cool so the the the, uh, the original 142 acres has been certified organic ever since we certified it. So we kept that's, everything in production. That's awesome. And what's been your biggest challenge in either well both transitioning and then also um, in in farming organically and regeneratively? 
Um, probably farming organic. The biggest challenge has really always been weeds. Um, trying to figure out how to, you know, effectively manage that when all mainly your only tool is um, cultivation um, or um, you know heat treatment or something like that or steam. So um, you're quite limited and um, it's challenging with the timing of, um, you know, seeding and weed emergence and, and such. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. always been a, a tricky one. And then, you know, it's, it's sort of the, you know, one of the, the pitfalls is like one thing, you know, you're allowed plastic culture and, and plastic films, which is a terrible waste of plastic and a mass and, and mm -hmm. such, but um, trying to find ways around that. Um, and still there hasn't, there isn't really good solutions yet. Hmm. And what we're finding, um, especially in the perennial crops, like the, the orchard and vineyard, mainly vineyards right now, but um, uh, with regenerative farming, um, actually looking at the problem differently, not as elimination of weeds, but uh, the addition of beneficial plants and, uh, yes. and or crops, um, just basically out competing the weeds. Yeah, that's or changing, really... or changing the soil environment such that you're, because a lot of the weeds that were growing were actually like, for example, downy brome. Um, they're an early successional weed, and in very bacterial dominant soils, mm -hmm. and so they, um, you know, that's the first thing that comes up every time you cultivate. So every time you cultivate, the same weed comes up again, and you keep doing it. You know, yeah. and after a while, it's like, you know, what did Einstein say? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And, uh, and we found that once we stop doing that and um, basically our, we do one cultivation pass a year to incorporate our cover crop seed and, um, and, and then changing the whole and pushing it towards a more fungal dominant um, soil profile, mm -hmm. those weeds just don't come up anymore. You know, it's amazing. just not the right environment for them. Yeah, that's really cool. And I love the, for the, the way you named the mindset shift from what looking at how to get rid of something that you don't want to how to create an environment for what you do want that's going to be working with your crops and the soil to produce um, an environment that supports your plants that you want to grow and where the weeds actually are like yeah no i'm not going to i'm not going to take this up <laughs> hello do you have names for your cows uh, lots of them do have names. <laughs> We're starting to get to the point where there's too many to name them all or keep track. <laughs> oh. Well, since they're there, why don't you tell us about your cows and why you have them and what role they play in your farm? So, so we have Highland cows. We started off with that. Um, we were trying to build up our herd with the thoughts of regenerative farming and having them go into the fields and into the vineyards mm -hmm. and also to use as meat production as well so but they're quite a lean cow so we've introduced yeah. a speckled park in with them as well it's a little bit um a little bit fattier meat mm -hmm. and um, they grow a little bit faster than the highland cows do okay. so now we're doing a cross of them and hopefully next year we'll will um, work on butchering them and being able to to sell them in our wine shop oh, and to a local butcher as well. Yeah. So it's really a soil to table operation, not just the wine, but also the other products that you put together. Yeah, and these guys, they we let them out into the vineyard in the winter time. So right until the spring, until we have bud break. And so they're fertilizing out there and they're eating the uh, crop that's in between the rows and underneath the grapevines as well. That's awesome. And so one of the things I think people are curious about is do they only eat the, the crop that's, that you plant underneath the grapevines or do they go at the grapevines at all as well? Well, that's why we take them out before bud break okay. so that they leave the grapevines alone. Okay. Yeah, and the grapevines, uh, when they're dormant, uh, the dormant vines are kind of tied up into the catch wires and such yeah. so um, even a bit of rubbing and such um, well with the exception we we've quickly learned uh, don't leave your bulls out there with them because the bulls right. yeah they get into uh, a fight next thing you yeah. know they've broken a few posts and stuff like that and 
Yes. And they just tear up stuff just for the sake of it. They're boys, right? <laughs> they you do. <laughs> yeah. If you gave them a stick of dynamite, they would use it. <laughs> but uh, but the, the main cow herd, they're quite calm, you know, with the, the steers and heifers uh, mixed mm-hmm. in. So, uh, you know, we found even with the bulls, it would be about uh, two to three man days to repair the damage on a 22 acre vineyard. Wow. Um, which wasn't crazy. But we were getting, you know, 60 to 90 days of winter feeding without supplementation That's amazing. Um, by with all the cover crops that we were growing under vine. So we're supporting the, uh, the grape crop with those cover crops, but also creating winter stockpile feed at the same time. And what, then, what have been, go ahead, sorry. And then, yeah, you come out in the, you know, the vineyard looks, you know, almost like a a golf green in the spring because they've been grazing all winter and there's you know cow pats all over the vineyard and it's like oh work's done that's great what are your favorite cover crops to plant with the wine vines or the grape vines uh so we treat the under vine and the dry row separately mm-hmm. um so under vine what are we're trying to achieve is uh for one not interfere with the grape crop itself so we mm-hmm. will try to grow low low growing plants um and have a good um a good diversity of functional groups you know at least four uh, if possible mm-hmm. um our main our main cover crop is uh winter lentils a mm-hmm. uh, very low growing nitrogen fixer but not super too much nitrogen because uh, you yeah. don't need a lot for grapes uh, and then the next uh, species on the list is flax which has really good fungal associations so we want to switch that that soil type from bacterial to fungal so we're trying to move in that direction uh, and then we grow mustard um, phacelia for uh, um, um, pollinators and mm-hmm. uh, predators Mm-hmm. And um, and then turnips, they're kind of the um, we use them. Turnips and radishes is kind of the uh, if, there's, if there's too much nitrogen, they'll suck that up, and then the root will rot. Yep. Sorry, there did we lose you for a sec? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm so curious. How do you plant right under the vines? Uh, we use an old um, uh, Vicon fertilizer spreader okay. with a banding nozzle on it. And um, yeah, and the, and the seed comes out so fast because they're all pretty little slippery seeds and such like that. We basically have to just about shut the nozzle completely okay. off and drive like heck to uh, get the rate low enough. Oh, wow. And, and uh, so, yeah, that, that gets done pretty quickly. And then we come back through behind that with um, uh, a shallow cultivation about two inches deep just to incorporate the seed in. Um, otherwise, the pigeons would probably eat it all. Right. And, How do you uh, cultivate it in though around the vines? Do you just have like a rake or something? Um, well, we have a, it's called a tournesol. It's uh, it was made in France. It's designed mm-hmm. for under vine um, cultivation. Oh. So yeah. it's essentially two spinning heads with um, yeah. horizontally spinning, spinning blades, almost like a mower that's designed to go two inches into the ground. Perfect. And uh, so, so it does really a very using... shallow cultivation, mm-hmm. doesn't get too deep um, yeah. or create pan. And um, yeah, we can, and then we just irrigate it, and then that's good for an entire year. Yeah, that's awesome. What have been, um, what have made, what's made the biggest difference? Do you think for your farm in farming regeneratively, organically? Use of water. Um, sort of the the key factor. I think. Well, wh- well, well, no. What's made the biggest difference? What's made the biggest difference? Yeah. I think the whole system of regenerative farming, mm-hmm. um, you know, when in organic farming, a lot of like what we were doing was a lot more of trying to get rid of weeds using mm-hmm. a lot of cultivation and such. And so we we're, we're always struggling. Like we're, we seem like we're doing the right things, but we just can't seem to move the needle on the organic matter. Mm-hmm. And, um, and sort of changing that whole mindset of keeping the ground covered and um, having a living plant at all times, you know, and, you know, incorporating the livestock, just bringing that whole system together. Um, Mm -hmm. We've really seen, even in those sandy, you know, our vineyards almost gravel in parts and we're moving, we're adding almost 0.4% organic matter a year. So it's, 
So yeah, for the past couple of years, we haven't had to bring in compost, which we usually do every year. Yeah. And also our water use is down. We yeah. have one vineyard where the soil is a little bit heavier that we're getting really close to dry farming. Wow, so that's with no irrigation at all? Right. Yeah. In the Okanagan, which is almost unheard of, right? Yeah, so we think we think it's possible. Like we have own rooted grapevines over the years that have kind of gone wild in the corners and stuff like that. And so we think with regenerative farming, being able to increase that organic matter, if yeah. we can get up over 3%, 3.5% um, in a few years, we should be able to start turning off the taps. Mm. And um, given, you know, the, the strains on the water resource, uh, you know, the more we can cut off, the better. Yeah, that's amazing. And what about for your vegetable crops? Because are you growing the vegetable crops or is that um, leased So we out? have it leased out yeah, to leased out. Um, yeah. someone that's been working with us for the okay. past 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll just leave that on the table then right now. So what, what we have been doing with him, though, is... Um, um, mm -hmm using the our other like pasture lands so whatever would be what whatever would be in summer fallow mm -hmm. uh we're planting to a multi-species cover crop mix mm -hmm. um grazing that multiple times a year maybe even seeding it two or three times um putting as many cycles through it and then he can go back and use that the next year for his vegetable crop so we're kind of getting the, the balance going the right way yes and, powerful. and then we're also you know, for example, instead of chopping the corn st um, stalks at the end of the year, uh, we'll take the cows in there and then that increases the cycling rate and gets that back biology back into the soil at the end yeah. of the season. So um, we're just really, um, but, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you try a little bit and, you know, we, you know, we don't want the cows to break out and eat the entire, you know, tomato crop, right? So yeah, you have to be careful in how you manage it and yeah. Yep. So true. And what's your favorite thing about farming? Each of you can answer this separately. Yeah. Well, I that this is our office. <laughs> right? So, as long as I want to be outside. Our hours, yeah. I love everything about it. Being out with mm. the animals, being out in the fields. I love the, I love the complexity of the entire system and just you know, pushing buttons and seeing what happens. And, um, and in, you know, organic and regenerative biodynamic farming, it's all about, you know, adding life, you know, to the system. Um, yeah. We just saw a new bird the other day, um, just mm. on the edge of the farm. Um, so cool. Yeah. And um, I think it was a Lewis woodpecker. Um, they're rare wow. in the area. There is a few pockets of them. Um, I was with my brother-in-law, Shelly's, Shelly's brother. And, um, he's a really, he really knows his birds. Yeah. And we were driving together and, and, uh, finally after about two or three minutes after I saw the bird, I said, did you see that? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, what is it? And he's like, I have no idea. <laughs> and it was like, you know, wow, because, it's uh, that rare. It was, uh, quite a few searches before we finally tracked it down. But yeah. Yeah. Oh, super cool. So it's, oh, cool. you know, always finding new things and, um, you know, working, working with your neighbors and, um, mm. you know, fellow, farmers um mm -hmm. we have a good uh, little group of uh guys that we all do a lot of cover crop work together awesome um, so i yeah, love that definitely. amplification of each other and support of each other and you mentioned biodynamics what kind what do you incorporate from the biodynamic systems um a lot of more the um from the animal side you know bringing in the mm -hmm. cows onto the land using the manure um for like the 500 and such um okay you know and then and basically the big piece out of bio, you know the um uh, biodiversity yeah. and such you know just looking at you know every trophic level below ground and above ground and, yes. and trying to bring that all into harmony everything so connected yeah so connected and what's the one piece of advice you'd have for somebody who is conventional farming and thinking about organic farming or someone who's just transitioning, what would you say to them? Um, you need to have patience. You, you, mm. When you go to do it, you have to commit for three or four years. 
Um, cause you're not really going to see the benefits until you start coming out the other side of that. But it's That's... going to be a lot of work and monitoring because you're still, you're trying to fix up everything you've done conventionally for the past number of years. Right. So you're going to have a bunch of problems that you're going to have to try and control organically. And then after the fourth year, they kind of settle themselves out and you've built up a little ecosystem. So nature starts to take care of a lot of what you were trying to eradicate before. Wow. I think your dog agrees with you. <laughs> He's he like, go, Shelly, go. Yeah. We, have a, we have a fun project right now. We just took over um, a conventional block of Chardonnay, two and a half acres. And wow uh last spring and um so it's been really fun because you know for the last 16 years everything's been very iterative and just kind of you know you know hard lessons learned and you know some fast some slow mm -hmm. um but it was nice to take basically all of that knowledge and then just throw it all at it you know from year one because you know when we first transitioned some older table grape blocks yeah they they just we're unhappy, <laughs> mm. you know, and knowing now what, you know, if we'd known then, you know, we would have had a much better transition yeah, and such. So, you know, anybody transitioning should plan on, you know, three or four years, mm -hmm. um, try, try and find a mentor, um, you know, somebody they can work with and trust that has been through yeah. it before. Um, because yeah, you know, you're going to get points where like, I got to do something and, and, yes. and, and you, you know, and over the years you build up that confidence that no, it's going to take care of itself. You might just have to wait an extra couple of days. And, That's right. Like that. Yeah. And yeah. Jean, I think you named really well, um, um, I'm not too sure it's trepidation. The, um, oh, the the ideas, some of the ideas around organic farming, which is just control the weeds, um, don't use chemicals, um, do everything naturally. And so this is a narrative that sometimes people jump into when they are jumping into organic farming. And, and that's kind of the, um, I guess the glossing over of what organic farming can be. And as it's grown in popularity, what some of the bigger, um, I don't know if it's bigger farms or not, but that's, that's kind of the, some, it's become some of the narrative, whereas with the grassroots farming of organics, it's really about exactly what you're doing, building the soil and building um, the ecosystem within the farm. And so would you encourage somebody who's looking to transition to really um, look for somebody who is also incorporating those regenerative practices or how important is that? I think it's almost starting regeneratively and then mm. working towards organically mm. farming. I think that's a, it's a better way to do it and yeah. a better insurance that you're going to be building up your soil and having something to farm in years to come. And I think eventually what will come from that is organic farming. I love that. And so if somebody was starting regeneratively to transition organically, where does someone start Shelley? Or Jean. Well, I think one thing is definitely with the cover crops and yeah. trying to keep the soil covered mm. as much as possible. And if there is cultivating as low and shallow as possible as well, so that you're not disturbing the soil. I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, introduction of animals, if possible, it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be cows, but sheep or chickens as well, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, we found that, you know, in our cover crops, you know, we have some fields that are not quite settled down yet and we'll plant a cover crop and all that comes up is sow thistle and mustard. Cows are great for fixing all those problems. Mm. So, yeah. you know, that was that was a field like you would go in there and like normally go, oh, I got to like risk that. Well, you know, that was, you know, $50 an acre plus diesel and everything. That's right. Oh, just stick the cows on it. They just ate it down, just reseeded again and the next crop comes up fine so wow, that's and then amazing. just reseeding right into right into the crop that they've mowed down so that you're not disturbing the topsoil or anything yeah yeah that's really powerful and then slowly using less and less chemicals to the point where you're not using anything and then you're fully regenerative yeah yeah and then you know it's it's interesting having come from you know a lot of years of organic farming 
you know, there's, there's always been a hole in the research, um, mm -hmm. you know, cause there's not a lot of, not a lot of money in the system for it. Right. And, um, you know, the money usually comes from the ag companies. Yeah. So for research, so yeah, there's always been this hole and, and it's interesting seeing sort of the, the surge in interest in regenerative farming. And it's not so much that, you know, there's a whole bunch of money in research. It's the fact that it's cost cutting down the cost of production mm -hmm. significantly that growers who are basically about to go bankrupt are being able to turn their farms around um, and by doing a more natural, healthy thing are actually making their farms more profitable. So that's really driving the needle. And then sort of as the system improves and gets healthier, they end up using less chemicals, saving more money, you know, and it's a um, uh, self-perpetuating cycle. What they call it a virtuous cycle. That's really powerful. Was that part of your drive to convert as well? Is the financial cost of the yeah i mean farming? that's always um that's always a big part of it um and we were finding as as an organic vineyard for example um we kind of plateaued off we got to a certain point but you know we were doing five to seven cultivation passes a year mm -hmm. um that created a bunch of problems of its of its own yeah and um and then sort of taking a look at that step back and like oh well if we plant all these cover crops we only have to deal with them once in an entire growing season. Um, right. <laughs> we just cut down the number of passes of going through the vineyard. And um, yeah, we're, I mean, we're, our cost of production now is much lower than even conventional farms. Wow. That's really powerful. And how about your yields? How are those compared to where they were at before? Uh, they keep getting better. We, uh, we actually had a bizarre year last year. Uh, our production was up 30%, whereas the industry average was down wow. about uh, 20%. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I'm, I'd like to get a few more data points because, you know, one-offs are, you know, one-offs. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but, you know, when generally the most of the industry is all saying the same thing and you go the opposite direction because you're, you know, you guys are a bunch of crazies doing something completely different, then maybe there's something to it. Well, especially just when you're looking be. at neighboring vineyards that had mm. the same oh. results being 20% down, clearly we're 30% up. Yeah. Man, that's huge. That's huge. And I had a question about that that was related to that. Let me just see if I can catch it again. Um, oh, where did it go? So you're talking about your vineyards increase in production. Um, shoot. It's yeah, it's, it's, um, it's really fascinating because we've um, we started uh, in the last three years doing um, uh, soil health tests. Yes. Oh, thank you. That's where I was going. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So, yes. it, um, you know, hearing about some of the research uh, with Rick Haney uh, with the Haney mm -hmm. test, uh, ANL Labs in Ontario now does a similar type of test. Uh, and so we've been doing that for the last three years. So we're seeing those we're seeing those biological improvements. So we're getting both, you know, we're getting the, the chemistry, the physics, and now the biology side of it. And um, it's quite fascinating, you know, in our soils uh, from the, from the chemistry side of it, you know, we only had about uh, four, four pounds an acre of nitrogen in the soil in our vineyard. Um, but going into the prior season, uh, we had about 50 parts that were available biologically that wouldn't show up on a regular soil test. So we knew Amazing. going into the season that we were already, we didn't need to add compost. Like we just grow our cover crops and, you know, and then to have that confirmation at the end of the year that our yields were up, yeah, you know, and they kind of played off the soil test that, you know, that was really good confirmation. Mm -hmm. um, so same similar thing going into this season uh we had adequate nutrition um in the fall going into this spring and then uh we have good healthy cover crops so we're we, again we put off not composting yeah um and so yeah it's uh it's a big saver uh in that way and you also mm -hmm. get that feedback loop uh what's actually what you're doing is actually working yeah. Tell us more a little bit about the testing, because it sounds like you're testing the um, organic matter. And I'm wondering how that's done. And then also um, what those other tests are and what you what we are actually able to measure. 
Yeah, so some of those tests are the, the organic matter is uh, one that you, you find in a regular uh, soil test. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a pretty simple test. Uh, basically just take a dry sample, weigh it, put it in the oven and burn off the organic matter, weigh it again. You can figure out your percentage of organic matter. And how um, much, what, but, what, what temperature do people um, put it bake it in the oven at? Uh, I don't actually don't know the what the okay. standards are for the. So this is somebody. This is a lab that's doing it for you. Yeah, this is a lab that's okay. doing it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then some of the other tests uh, they do um, uh, CO two um, respiration. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that test, uh, again, they dry the soil down, uh, wet it back up to a standard amount, put it in a little chamber, and then basically wake it, wake up all the biology and get it working and test how much CO2 is coming off of that. So that gives you a, a proxy for how much biological activity you have in the soil. Um, it doesn't tell you who's in there. It, you know, it could be a lot of bacteria, it could be a lot of fungus, it could be a yeah. lot of everything. Yeah. Um, but it does tell you sort of relative levels. Uh, and then there's cool. also um, um, organic carbon availability. So carbon yeah. that's not locked up as humus yet, but that's cycling in like the bodies of fungus and bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, that carbon cycling is really, really important to plant growth. That's really the one of the big drivers. Um, how much um, biologically available nitrogen? Again, that's usually like, you know, the bodies and the poop of all these bacteria and fungus and yeah. nematodes and, and what have you. So, um, a lot of the, all those factors go together. Um, there's some formulas for getting a soil health number. And um, I mean, the key to it is you always use the same lab. If they're a good mm -hmm. lab so that you, mm -hmm. your numbers are consistent year over year and you yeah. can track what's going on. But yeah, we found prior to doing regenerative farming, we really just couldn't move the needle on the organic matter. And mm -hmm. um, we're really moving it significantly now. Um, doing so regenerative powerful. Farming. And so you were measuring that organic matter when you were conventional farming and then you've just continued through? Yeah, we've been doing soil tests for, I don't know, gosh, my dad was doing them, my grandfather was doing them. So, wow. you know, it's the background um, on our soils is around uh, 0.8, I think, somewhere in there. And so we've taken our vineyard from that sort of 1.4 up to about two and a half now, 2.6 in a couple of years, so. Of organic matter. Yeah. That's powerful. That's really, really exciting. Neat. So it's, and, and you see that, um, like I said, a virtuous cycle, once you get that extra organic matter and it doesn't, you know, half a percent is a big deal. Um, yeah. All those cover crops grow a little bit better and they're a little yes. bit more drought resistant. And then you get a little bit more biomass and then, so then mm -hmm. you can put more in again. And so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cover crops are so powerful and it's not just um, like you're in a you're in a vineyard and you're in a situation where you're planting cover crops and um, uh, covering the soil can also be really powerful, even in smaller um, environments. And I just have about an acre and a half of here with no equipment. And so I decided to do no till um, farming. I, I initially turned turned the the land over. Uh, through tilling, but um, this is my second year, and we planted garlic last fall, and I put straw over it, and I'm in Saskatchewan, it's dry, like it's dry, dry, you, you, I mean, you, it, it's windy one day, and the top four inches are dry, even though this land has been um, or, organic, like no, nothing's been done to it, or it hasn't been sprayed with chemicals or anything, and all of the land that's been covered with straw still has moisture in it. Mm -hmm. Like still, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. It's amazing. Yeah, it's really, yeah. really powerful. And I don't think people understand that until they really witness it sometimes. Yeah, I mean, there's that keeping that ground covered and having those living plants growing. I mean, we've even this spring, like we're recorded one of the driest springs in the Okanagan in mm -hmm. you know 100 years or something. But when you have plants growing out there already, you go out in the morning and they've captured dew. Like there is you know, and they just keep capturing dew every morning and they're getting that little watering. And so, you know, and if they can keep going and keep pumping stuff into the soil, then you're moving ahead. That's so cool. Tell us what's unique about your farm. Um, 
I guess, I don't know. Like you have some. Well, I think the biodiversity of it, one, the size of it. So we have 650 acres and then the amount of products we grow on it because there's over 40 different fruits and vegetables growing on it. Then we have the vineyard and then we have the wine shop as well that is really family focused. Mm -hmm. And we do, we do tours to just introduce people to regenerative farming and organic farming and what we're doing on our whole establishment here. And then we also do mini farm tours for kids while their parents do wine tasting. So oh, it's really it. trying to educate people about what we're doing and regenerative farming. And then we also bring schools in to do school educational farm to table tours as well. That's really powerful. That's super powerful. Connecting people, not just with their food, but actually the experience of the food in the ground, on the vines. Yeah, picked. seeing the uh, seeing the entire system, like it's one thing to tell people, but the, you know, the show and tell is, is really yeah. powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really yeah. is. It's yeah. really cool. And that's one and, of the cool things ahead. about, a, I guess, an organic farm is, you know, over time you build up such, you know, uh, disease resistance and, and such, you know, I, I sometimes chuckle at all these farms with biosecurity signs at the gate, you know, it's like, you know, what are you, what are you afraid of? And, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we have a basically an open farm, like you can come and visit and we'll show you all the corners and you can see what's going on. And, and, um, we're not really concerned about that because there is so much good stuff going on. It's not going to be a problem. Right. And so can you just speak to that biosecurity just, uh, just briefly to tell us what that is? Um, farms actually have signs where you can't go on because they're worried about what you might bring onto the land? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's more prevalent with uh, livestock producers, especially, mm. um, you know, where it's high intensity livestock production, you know, like okay. with hog barns and chicken uh, barns and such like that, where, you know, any kind of disease gets in, it can wipe out an entire house. Right. And, um, right. You know, with uh, with our farming, it's you know quite low density with the animals, and they have lots of open space, so there's not those uh, same pressures on them. Right, and so there's lots so. of biodiversity. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. And um, in closing, I'd like to ask this question. It's a brand new question that I'm going to be asking all of our guests, and you get to be the first <laughs> ones who are asked, actually, as I'm deepening into and learning about interviewing and sharing space with people and that is what does regeneration mean to you you can each take a moment to answer that well i think it is ensuring that you're doing the most for your land that you possibly can to build up your topsoil so that you can ensure that your kids and grandkids and their grandkids have something to farm years to come. And uh, I'm going to paraphrase a quote I heard. Um, it's not degeneration, which a lot of our farming systems in the past have done and still are doing, um, you know, mining the soil, um, mining the environment to support the farming. Uh, it's not sustainability because most of our farmlands have already been degraded to such an extent that sustaining that degraded resource is kind of pointless. Mm -hmm. So it's taking that resource, uh, the land base, and building as much life back into it as you can. Very powerful. Thank you for that. I love that. And is there anything that you really want to share with people, uh, farmers, uh, consumers, the world that we haven't touched on today? Anything else? I just think the importance of regenerative farming over anything else so that we do have land to farm for years to come and doing as much as we can to to not deplete our soils. It's just such a huge thing right now that we all need to be looking at. Yeah. yeah, and if anybody wants to um, you know come do one of our tours or reach out to us, um, we're available. Uh, we love talking about this stuff and uh, come visit when it's safe to do so. And um, yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, I cannot wait to visit your farm. I absolutely can't wait. So tell us, um, tell us where you are in the world and uh, how we can find you. So we're eight kilometers north of Oliver, BC. So, and just a half hour out of Penticton, just north or south of Penticton and a half hour south of Osoyoos. So we're open April to um, December and uh, we're open five days a week from 11 till five. So from Wednesday to Sundays. By appointment awesome. only. Yes. By appointment right now. Is it always by COVID. appointment only? Or it hasn't always been. It did start last year with COVID, mm -hmm. but we've found that we can provide such an amazing experience to people when we do by appointment only because now we do seated wine tastings where wow. they have a full hour to spend and they have a dedicated staff that is able to give them the history of the farm and all the information about the um, wines. So we offer three different types of tastings and then we do picnics as well and live music on Sundays. And then with our pick your own with Seacrest Organics, they're doing by appointment only and just finding that it's so much easier when people book an appointment and they're not rushed going through and they can have time spent with them with the staff. So yeah. we think that we're gonna carry on the by appointment only just to give everybody a great experience and our staff as well. I love that. There's always gifts in adversity and when things come from out of nowhere right there's always something yeah. that we can take away from it definitely yeah. definitely awesome yeah. well um we'll make sure to share your information and tell people to go follow covert farms on their website on social media and when you're in the area go and visit them and book your wine tour and get a farm tour thank you so much for joining us gene and shelly i deeply appreciate all the work you're doing and the difference you're making for our planet today and for years to come. Thank you, Natalie. It was Thank a pleasure. Thank you very much, Natalie. Grateful you joined us for that conversation and interview. If you haven't subscribed to Heart and Soil Magazine yet, head over to heartandsoilmagazine.com. Click on that subscribe button and join us for just $39.99 a year. You make yourself an amazing